Hi, welcome back to the channel. I'm Chris, and this is Fox's Electric Adventures. Today, I have a special treat for you. It's kind of a longer video than I would normally do, but it's totally worth the time. You see, I'm going to be talking to Alex Yukonot. He is a rep for ePropulsion. Now, ePropulsion is doing amazing things in the electric propulsion space in the marine industry. So I was very fortunate to be able to sit down or stand up <laughs> with Alex and discuss what ePropulsion has for you. Now, the interesting thing about Alex is he's not only a sales rep, he installs. So if you're going to do an inboard system, Alex is your guy to go to. So let's get into the video. So we are here at the Norwalk Boat Show and in Connecticut. And I am here with Alex You cannot, Alex, tell me about yourself. Yeah, so uh, I'm a dealer for e-propulsion. We're here at the e-propulsion booth. I do electric propulsion conversions on boats. And I also sell uh, smaller electric motors from two to about 400 horsepower for outboards, 15 horsepower to 1,500 horsepower inboards. There's a lot going on in this space, both in battery technology and in performance. So Alex, let me ask you um, about the current state of electrification in the marine industry. Yeah, so the, the marine industry is, I would say that we're about toddler stage in a comparing it to a lifespan. Um, some parts of the world are, are getting into middle school, but we're, we're just, we're, we're not quite just starting out, um, but we are lagging behind. One question I have on that is yeah. what is the hesitancy that people are, are basically coming to you oh. with? Um, that's so, you know, part of the problem of, you know, if, if people don't want it or trust it. There's a lot of bad information floating around in the electric world. Uh, whether it's cars or boats or battery technologies, um, there's a lot of bad information floating around and a lot of people are are taking this bad information as gospel truth. Right. A lot of this information, you know, 10 or 15 years ago wasn't bad information. It was it was true information. But but once people accept a level of information that just kind of bulldozes over everything else. So batteries have gotten a lot safer over the last 10 or 15 years. Battery lifespans have increased significantly over the last 10 or 15 years. The potential lifespan of a lithium battery like 15 years ago was probably 15 to 20 years. And that's the same potential 20 life years or oh, the life of the, well, life, the life of the battery. Of the battery. Got it. Um, and that that is technically still accurate so we've got a lifespan like um we've got a couple of motors behind us with lithium iron phosphate batteries and and those batteries should last 15 to 20 plus years they'll actually age out before the before cell degradation really takes hold what does age um, out mean uh cells degrade in two different ways they they degrade from cycle like over cyclage and they degrade from age. They do have a shelf life. You know, these batteries absolutely do have a shelf life. What and, about thermal runaway? Uh, it's extremely rare. Even in the automotive world, thermal runaway is extremely rare. Um, it was not all that rare 10 years ago, but battery management systems have gotten safer. Um, battery chemistries have gotten safer. So this is the e-propulsion X12. So this is 12 kilowatts. We've got a 20 kilowatt motor and a 40 kilowatt motor in outboards. So it's X12, X20, X40. 
These are a 96 volt uh, motor. This actually works on the same voltage as the boat that, that we have in the water here at the show. So it's 96 volts. We build the battery packs out of modules and uh, much like an electric car. However, we build the, we can size the battery pack to your requirements. So like the boat that we have in the water, which has a 10 kilowatt motor and a single 10 kilowatt hour battery, that boat actually will get about 75 miles of range uh, under power. It's not a fast boat, but, um, but it'll get there. Uh, these motors are designed to run at a little bit higher RPM, so we can we can uh, potentially get a boat up onto plane um, if it's sized appropriately. Again, we're talking about hull efficiencies, so like a Chesapeake Dead Rise skiff, this boat would have no this motor would have no problem getting that boat up onto a plane and running at a reasonable cruising speed. So Alex, let me ask you a question. I've seen this running. It was running while we were talking five feet away from it. Uh, less than five feet. I mean. So, and it's, and it's not running at its slowest speed. Um, this is probably, that's probably about as slow as I can get that motor to run. But, no matter how slow you would be having a gas motor run, we would not be able to have this conversation sitting next to you. Uh, one really cool thing I mentioned earlier is that the battery floats. So we can just take this battery and drop it in. And there we go. Um, yeah, I think that's a pretty cool feature. Uh, it's not as gimmicky as it looks or as it sounds um, because most of the other electric manufacturers don't have floating batteries. Get some electronic spray cleaner, uh, clean out the clean out the connector, and then take a little bit of dielectric grease and just treat that space with dielectric grease. Awesome. Um, that's part of the maintenance schedule on this motor is at least once a year, putting a little bit of dielectric grease on the pins and plugging it in. And that just helps to keep corrosion. So let me ask you a question. Um, how do you get to the impeller? We go over to one of the gas motor booths and we take part their motors because we don't have an impeller. You don't have an impeller? No, no impeller. There's no water moving through this motor. So when you're done using in salt water, the only thing that you ever have to do is to hose it off. There's no oil, there's no gas, there's no impeller, there's no water flowing through the motor. Winterization is really easy. Take it out of the salt water, hose it off, and put it in your basement. Do you have to have it on like a trickle charger or anything to maintain the battery? So for the battery health, you charge it up to 100%. Uh, this is this motor specific. To store it for the winter, you charge it up to 100%. The battery management system, figures out after a certain period of time of no use, that battery management system says it's time to go into storage mode. It starts to self-discharge to 60%, which is its ideal storage capacity. Uh, and then in the spring, you just charge it back up. So it's basically gonna hold that 60, roughly. Yeah, It'll, you'll have some drain, but. 40 to 60% is its safe space. Um, and you don't have to do anything. You just clean it, put it in, Charge it to 100%, put it into storage. That's, really That's amazing. Oh, yeah, yeah, super cool. So this is the point where I'm supposed to say, hey, like, subscribe, and all that stuff. All right, here's the deal. Most of you don't have a YouTube account, so you can't subscribe. I get it. So if you like green energy and you like doing positive things for the earth, like I'm trying to make content for people to think differently about how they propel their, their vehicles, Go get a YouTube account. Then it's free. Then you can subscribe to this channel, hit the notification bell. You never have to do that again once you do it. And then my videos, you can like them, you can dislike them, you can leave a positive comment, you can leave a negative comment. All feedback is good. All YouTube cares about is how much interaction do you have and how many subscribers you have. The more I have and the more interaction, the more they're going to show my video to people who aren't seeing it. So I hope you help me out. 
Let's get back to the video. A couple of more options that we have. This motor here is a 10 kilowatt motor for inboard applications. This is the same motor that we have on both in the wild. It's about 15 horsepower. The rest of the world uses kilowatts, so that's why it's labeled as a 10 kilowatt motor. Um, the controls, you've got a, we've got a touch screen for a lot of the controls for looking at information on the motor, looking at information on the charging system. This is a lot like the screen in your car, so I can get a bunch of different information on this, this screen uh, about power usage. And uh, as a dealer, I can get into the backside a little bit and look at battery health and stuff like that. Um, this is one of our throttle options. It's also the power, so the one of the buttons will power on the system. Uh, if it's running on the outboard, that that we have on display, uh, trim and tilt buttons on the side of the throttle. Um, pretty pretty cool little unit. I have a paddleboard motor, so this could go. It could get strapped to the bottom of of a kayak, or it it's got adapters for different fin slots on paddleboards. A uh, really cool option if you're doing a bunch of paddleboarding. You're on a lake, the wind comes up, and you've got to get back. Um, it's got like a, if I remember correctly, it's got like a five or six mile range easily. Uh, the, the throttle control just straps to your paddleboard paddle or kayak paddle. When you just control the speed, it doesn't have reverse, but that's okay. Uh, the, the battery that's underneath it. Uh, this is a solid state battery. It's, it's a battery that I use for, um, both propulsion and house banks on boats and solid state batteries are the next generation of batteries. There's an, there's a, a very, they're extremely safe batteries. There's a near zero fire risk disease batteries. They're significantly safer than like gas, which is an explosive. These uh, batteries are just fantastic. They're three times the power density of lithium iron phosphate uh, for the same amount of weight. This battery would be 85 pounds. They've derated these batteries a little bit, but we can fit in the same amount of space, 900 amp hours. And a uh, lithium iron phosphate battery is typically around 300 amp hours for its electric space, which is a pretty wild power density batteries. They're not inexpensive batteries, but watt hour for watt hour, so that you're comparing it to a high quality lithium iron phosphate battery, it's competitive. We're a little bit more expensive because they're, they're competitive, uh, especially because of the weight savings. Wow. Uh, and then uh, we can move over to the pod drive. This is a 9.9 .9 horsepower pod. Wow. Um, and we have a similar control for the pod. Uh, it's not a touch screen, but it's got drop down menus that we can scroll through for different settings. And we've got different throttle options uh, available for this, for this line. So here we are uh, again at the Norwalk Boat Show. Uh, we're looking at the, the E-Propulsion Navy Series motor. This is a Navy 6.0 which is a 9.9 .9 horsepower continuous output motor. The batteries to go with it. Generally, I would do the larger battery on the bottom. Their E E163 battery. The E60 battery is an excellent option for the smaller Navy motor. Um, both of these motors are available with different throttle arrangements. We can do a tiller throttle, uh, tiller controls, or we can do a remote steering uh, remote throttle setup similar to like what we talked about with the pod motor. Um, so we we would have a screen and a throttle. Um, and then you can hook it up to a steering wheel like on a center console. Boat. So this is a Drascom launch. It was originally powered by a eight horsepower Westerbeek diesel. The owner of the boat asked if we could do an electric drive system on this boat, and the answer to that is absolutely yes. So we took out that eight horsepower Westerbeek and put in a 10 kilowatt uh, e-propulsion drive system with a 10 kilowatt hour e-propulsion battery. The 10 kilowatt e-propulsion drive 
is rated to a, around 15 horsepower. The system is 96 volts and everything fits super nice in here. We did have to expand the engine compartment a little bit, uh, mostly to accommodate the battery. To repower this boat, we had to remove all of the diesel equipment, the eight horsepower engine, the fuel tank, the 12 volt battery for starting. Um, all of that stuff uh, was removed and the owner actually resold it. But uh, once everything's removed, the e-propulsion motor really just sat in almost the exact same spot as the Westerbeek did. Alignment for these inboards, we just aligned it just like you do a regular diesel or gas engine. The motor itself is so much smaller and so much lighter than the diesel that you don't need any big tools to, to shim it around or, or make adjustments. You can, I, can, I can pick that motor up and carry it down the dock if I really had to. So if I'm in a situation um, where I've trashed my motors, yeah, uh, my diesel or my gas, yeah, and I got twin screws, and yeah. I decide, you know what, um, ripping these out again, and because I already had them repowered, yeah, ripping them out again, and thinking about electric, yeah, um, cost-wise, if I've been through two engines already, um, uh, four, four technically because it's a twin screw, right, so. If we're doing like for like, diesel to electric, um, gas is, is pretty cheap. Gas engines are pretty cheap. You can get you know, a, a 350 Chevy and marinize it for a few thousand dollars. Like it, they're, not, they're not all that expensive. But a diesel engines, for a basic electric system, we're competitive. This system, current market pricing, We'd be looking at around twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars if you were, and that's installed. That's installed, sea trialed, and customers happy and on their way. Uh, if you were going to get a, a comparable diesel engine installed by a dealer, sea uh, trialed, and customers happy and on their way, a little less happy <laughs> with all the noise, we're very competitive. So that diesel would cost you between twenty dollars and $25,000. The big benefit for a system like this is that once that system's underway, there's really minimal maintenance involved in this system. There is oil in the gearbox on this motor, and not all electric motors have gearboxes, but this one specifically does. We check that motor, or we check that oil every once in a while, and it's about every 1,500 hours we change that oil. It's about an ounce and a half of mineral oil. It's not even like special oil. It's just, you could buy it at CVS. A 10 ounce thing is about $10. Other than that, for this boat, with no water cooling system or anything like that, there's no water pump to change. There's no hoses or belts to check. It's an air-cooled motor. There's a little fan on the front of it that you hear turn on every once in a while, but with an insulated engine box like this boat has, it's virtually soundless. You get to hear all of the other noises in nature. The and boat if you're with someone else, you can have a conversation and it's really a hear normal each other. volume conversation. No screaming yeah. and yelling over the That's right. roar of the engine. Yeah, you've got a shaky diesel engine. They're loud. You've got to talk over them. Versus this, you're just having a normal conversation. I mean, the wind right now is louder than this motor is running. So I don't know about you, but I thought that was an amazing interview. I really enjoyed Alex and the information that he shared about electric propulsion. It's actually got me thinking, maybe I'll do a project boat. I'll go out and find a nice, beautiful older boat that needs new engines, rip those out, and put in electric. I think that'd be a great project. I think I'm gonna to have to look into that. Well, this has been an awesome video for me. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm Chris, and this is Fox's Electric Adventures.